The message is entitled, The Day Heaven Fooled Earth. The Day Heaven Fooled Earth. And uh, if you have your Bibles or devices, you can open up with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, and he's, uh, he's writing a message, and his, uh, his message that he's conveying in, uh, in this particular passage is uh, the fact that he is, um, the message that he's conveying is the fact that, that previously he wanted to, um, he wanted to talk about uh, Christ but he was in a setting where he used human philosophy in order to communicate the message. That's what was happening. And so uh, as he was communicating this message in this previous time, he got a few takers and a lot of laughs as he was trying to humanly kind of engage on their level. And so he comes back to the Corinthian church, and he, he makes this statement. And this is, I'm not going to read this. I may be earlier, I'll read it later. But he makes this statement. He said, I declare to know nothing else except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all he said I'm going to preach from now on. I'm not going to try to use Greek philosophy and everything to convince people. I'm going to preach who Jesus is and what he did on the cross and the fact that he rose from the dead. Something got settled in his heart that particular uh, time. And so he comes back to the Corinthian church, and he begins. And so we start in verse 6 of chapter 2, and, and we'll just kind of barge in on, on what he's uh, talking about there, and, uh, and we'll see what he has to say. And he gives us a verse that's related to my sermon title. He says, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age, or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time. And here's the verse I want to key on on today. For none of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has ever conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. What a fascinating verse. Paul says, essentially, that if the rulers of that age would have truly understood who Jesus was, they would not have crucified him. You think, oh well, we have a problem. So I asked the question, after reading that particular verse, I asked the question, what would they have done if they would have known that he was God's one and only son? What would they have done? I don't know. We'll leave that for our table discussion. It's a fascinating thought, isn't it? He said if they really would have known, they would not have crucified Jesus. But the fact is, God had to fool the rulers of the age, because it was necessary that Jesus go to the cross. And so he had to trick them, so to speak. Sometimes we're not used to think God trick people, God fool people. Well, in this case, he had to keep them in the dark, literally, so that they would accomplish his goal and mission. We don't always think of God that way. If you look up the word rulers, who were the rulers? If you look that up, actually you'll find that the word ruler means the, the first in kind. In other words, the, the one that makes the decision. It can actually pertain to political rulers of that day, and it can also pertain to rulers of the unseen realm. Yes, God actually fooled the devil into taking Jesus to the cross. We don't often think about that. Not just the rulers of the age to take him to the cross. He actually had to fool the devil to get Jesus there. You think, wow, is that really so? Is that possible? Well, again, if we look at this 
verse and look at what it means in context, you have to also consider that and include that. So we get started here today. God had to keep hidden the necessity of Jesus dying on the cross. What would they have done if they've understood it? I already asked that particular question. See, I think that uh, sometimes, not that God tricks us, but sometimes God doesn't show us the whole story, does he? Because we're looking at this, and we're analyzing that, and we're thinking this, and we're saying, I don't see God working over here, and then all of a sudden he pops up on the other side and goes, whoa, did you see that? Do you see this? Not that he's fooling us, but sometimes he keeps things hidden from us. And we're walking through life thinking it's one way, and suddenly he pops up on the other side and said, no, it's this way. Do you see it? This is what I'm doing, not that. That's a little bit. That might be you, but I'm doing something way greater than what you had in mind. Pops up on the other side. So, in reality, the thing of God fooling us is perhaps not quite outside of how we live and our relationship with him. Because he always has something bigger in mind than we do. He always has something greater in mind than what we think about. So number two, how did God fool the rulers to crucify Jesus? Let's just talk about that for a few moments. How did he, what did I say? A few months. <laughs> gotcha. I'm glad you're talking back to me this morning. It's good you're listening. How did God fool the rulers to crucify Jesus? In John chapter 9, verse 7, the Jews insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. We heard that in the video this morning. Billy Graham talking about the fact of why did they crucify Jesus. The end result was he claimed to be the Son of God. Not for what he did, but who he was that they took him to the cross. They said they had a law that said that anybody that claimed to be the Son of God is an imposter. Therefore, we're going to crucify them. They asked him point blank, are you the Son of God? And Jesus, at one particular time near the end of his life, said yes, knowing that when he was saying yes, he was going to the cross. The rulers, they didn't have any idea what they were doing, but they were falling right into God's plan. Right in God's plan. Right in the center of it. A couple of things I thought about why they crucified Jesus. They were not able to receive updated truth. They were not able to receive updated truth. Look at Luke 18, 31 through 34. We'll get back to Corinthians here in a few moments, but uh, maybe you have the verses on, on uh, uh, you can follow along if you like. But in Luke 18, Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We're going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the prophets, about the Son of Man, will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, they will insult him, they will spit on him, they will flog him, and they will kill him. And on the third day he will rise again, verse 34, and the disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. Sounds like something pretty important is hidden from his own disciples. They didn't understand. They didn't get it. His disciples seemed to have some sense about who Jesus was because they kept following him even though it was hard, and yet when Jesus began to instruct them about what would happen on this weekend that we celebrate, they were clueless. They were in the dark. They didn't, they didn't understand. And so, in essence, they weren't able to get updated with what God is doing now. There's times that Wanda and I have conversations about different things that we do and say and maybe habits that we have and one of us will make this comment, you always do this, or you always say this, and then we'll call time out, and we'll say, when was the last time I actually said that? When was the last time I actually did that? And one of us, whoever was bringing the accusation, and the other was listening to go, oh, I think maybe two years ago. And we go, yeah, let's get updated. Let's get updated in where we're at right now, 
Let's don't live in the past. Let's don't live uh, based on something that happened two or three years ago. Let's get updated with now and let's move forward. You see, those that were living that day weren't able to be updated with what God was doing. Another factor that I find fascinating is that historically there were others that were called the Son of God. Maybe you're not aware of that, but Jesus was not the first to be called the Son of God. Adam was called the Son of God. Makes sense, doesn't it? Because he was the first human being, so he was the Son of God. Israel, the nation of Israel, was called the Son of God in Scripture. In Exodus and in, in Hosea, it calls Israel the nation God's Son. And then David... And his line of kings that followed after him, they were called the Son of God. They were, those titles were actually given to them. So it wasn't a foreign idea that someone would call themselves the Son of God. But the difference with Jesus is that he was called the only Son. The only Son. There was a distinction about Jesus that even though the others had the term, they died. And Their legacy continued, but they died. Jesus was taking what was started in the Old Testament, and he was going to bring it to fulfillment in the new. He was going to start something totally new that involves us, that had never been done before. That's the distinction and the difference. The rulers, um, so we've got Adam, Israel, David's kingship. The rulers had in mind that Jesus was an imposter. And basically, they were gathering that from their historical readings. He's just another one that's calling himself the Son of God. We're not going to listen to him. Miracles had been done before in the Old Testament. Miracles weren't new. Maybe some of the miracles were new, but hey, miracles happened before. It wasn't that that set him apart. But the fact is that he called himself the Son of God was a distinguishing factor. Matthew 26, 63 through 66, the high priest said to him, him being Jesus, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, Now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. And so again, what did they base that on? They based that on the fact of historically there were others called the Son of God, and here we just have another one. And so let's crucify him, not knowing that they were falling into the very purpose for why he was born. The rulers had in mind their own interests. Another possibility The rulers had in mind their own interests. Listen to Mark 8, 27 through 33. Jesus and his disciples went to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way, he asked them, that his disciples uh, were with him, who do people say that I am? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, uh, still others, one of the prophets. Verse 29, then Jesus gets straight to the point. But how about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man may suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days raised again. And he spoke, verse 32, he spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, and he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. What an amazing story. Many times it's hard to grasp what what God is doing. And he gives us a, a glimpse at times. And perhaps he thought that because they identified him As the Son of God, he can go ahead and tell them what is to come, what the Son of God would go through in order for them to gain the freedom. And Peter's not, he's not getting it and he's not buying it. 
In fact, he begins to rebuke God, so to speak. And he takes him aside and said, listen, stop talking about that. That's not going to happen to you. What are you saying? And Jesus says, I've got something for you, Peter. Satan, get out of him. (laughs) Wow, that would have been an eye-opening for Peter, wouldn't it? I'm sure he wasn't prepared for that one. Peter was in the dark. He had no idea what was going on. You see, they were, they were interested in their own interests. They were interested in being set free as a nation under the tyrant of Roman rule. They were interested in, in, in God coming and, and, and really uh, you know, zeroing in on the Jewish people and, and really bringing his kingdom down. And God had much bigger picture in mind than just Israel that day. John 12, 23 and 24, this is not in your notes. Jesus said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. If it dies, it produces many seeds. You see, when Jesus died, he was that divine seed. And he died on that cross and went into the ground knowing that when he came out of the ground three days later, that he would now scatter this righteous seed to anyone who believed. And that's us today. We're the recipients of him coming out and saying, I died so that you can live. And you can have this righteous seed into your life. And you can grow by faith and come into my likeness and into my image. And that's the process that we find ourselves in that believe that God can actually live inside. Not come around and not come upon, but he can actually live inside of us. That's what Jesus did on the cross. That's what we celebrate today. The rulers wanted a Messiah, again, to break them free of Roman rule. But Jesus said, no, I've got something way bigger in mind. I want to remove the sin of the whole world. Not just you and, and the nation that I love. I want, to, I want to fix everybody. I want to free everybody. And you know what? That's a message for you and I. Because whatever you believe that God wants to do in and through your life, He's got something bigger in mind. He's got something way greater in mind. Some people think, well, if I could, if I could just know Jesus and, and, and maybe get my family saved, well, well, he wants to get your community saved. He wants to get your neighbors saved. You say, well, I don't know if I can follow God. Well, he wants, he's got something way bigger in mind than what you think he does. In the same way happened here, they were thinking about themselves. Jesus said, man, I got a whole lot more. So number three, our response That Jesus is the only Savior who can remove our sin and give us access to the righteousness to be righteous before God. Again, the verse there written for you, 1 Corinthians 2.2, I cited earlier, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That was Paul's response. Now in this passage in 1 Corinthians 2, the Apostle Paul talks about three different responses or three different types of people that and how they respond to this message. And today, sitting in here, probably there's a representation of any one of these three. The first one is what he calls or perhaps I call, is a natural response. A natural response to Jesus Christ dying for our sin and that we have sin in our life that needs to be cleansed and He comes and cleanses us. He doesn't just cover us, He cleanses us and makes us righteous before God. You try to reason that out with human reasoning and philosophy and and what the world gives you through science, you'll go nuts. You won't be able to reason it out. It won't work for you. And yet the Apostle Paul says there's people that try to reason it out. I don't need God in my life. He's a crutch for others. I'll be okay. I'm better than so-and-so and not as good as such-and-such, but, uh, you know, I'll just, I'll just take my chances. That's reasoning it out. Let's look at what, what Paul says 
He says in, um, in verse 3, I came to you in weakness and fear with much trembling. My message and my preaching was not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. We, however, do not speak a message of wisdom among the mature, not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. That's a natural response. Try to reason it out. It just absolutely won't work. Paul says that the reasoning of this age will come to nothing. They begin to re- Why is it necessary? Why do I need it? And again, Paul says, if you try to do that, it simply won't work. He tried to do that with the Greek philosophers on Mars Hill. And he came away with little fruit. And he decided, I'm not doing that again. Paul said, I don't come with you being a great preacher and persuasive words. In fact, those that were trying to reason it out said, this great man of Paul, I mean, he can hardly speak. He can hardly carry himself on the pulpit. He can, what kind of a guy is this? So it wasn't from the human intellectual level. Paul was not impressive. But he says, I come with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. With a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So we can have a natural response to needing Jesus in our lives and knowing that uh, we need uh, cleansed and healed and set free. We can also have the second category is a carnal response. We find that in chapter 3. Chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. Paul writes, Brothers, I do not address you as spiritual, but worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it yet. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you acting like mere men? For this one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Paulus. Are you all not mere men? What's Paul saying? He says, there's a response that we can have of thinking that we're following men and not following Christ. That we're actually following an individual instead of following Christ and Christ in that particular leader. And a lot of times that mistake is made throughout the church. I hear different people say, you know, when that, when that pastor left, I left. My question is, well, who, you, who were you following at that church? I understand we get attached to people and personalities and so forth. I understand. But the question that I have to ask you is when we come together like this, who are we really following? In fact, I think I'm going to talk about that next Sunday. I think that's a great topic. Who are we really following? Because it's something for us to address. Paul said there's a a carnal response. What's a carnal Christian? A carnal Christian is not somebody that doesn't know Christ. In fact, they've made a decision to follow Christ, but they do not allow Christ to get involved in any of their life decisions. You ever been around someone like that? You know that they go to church. If you'd ask them, they would say, well, yes, I I believe in Christ. But you never hear any conversation. You never see any action. You never see them talking about what it means to follow Christ. But if you would ask them, they would say, yes, I do follow Christ. That's a carnal Christian. That they have problems come up, and instead of going to God, say, God, help me, they try to reason it out themselves. They try to fix it on their own, own way and own terms without inviting God in. That's a carnal Christian. Yes, they know Christ, but they're trying to fix everything on their own. The third response that we can have is a spiritual response. A spiritual response. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting at verse 11. For those who among men, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have, not received, if we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, 
not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but words taught to us by the Spirit expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments above all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. When was the last time you thought about that if you have Jesus, you have access to the mind of Jesus, which is the mind of God? It's pretty profound, isn't it, to think about the access that we have and the little that we tap into at times, that we just neglect. Sometimes it's out of not knowing, and other times it's just out of not slowing down enough to say, wait a minute, God, where are we going? And making course correction along the line. Today, God is not hidden or trying to hide himself from anybody. He's not trying to fool anybody. He is flat out in the open. And so if he's trying to, you think he's trying to fool you today or get you to do something you don't want to do, no, sometimes he does do things that we don't see, but he's not fooling anybody. He's flat out in the open, and he wants you to know that. God's not hiding himself. But one of the things that I, I believe that a, a spiritual person begins to get a hold of is this, and it's found in verse 9. He says this, No eye has seen, and no ear has heard, and no mind has ever conceived what God has prepared for those that love Him. How God has revealed it, or God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. I believe that God is calling us as church To walk through, walk out of the natural response. Walk through the carnal response. And get to the place where we have a spiritual response that we settle into this verse. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has ever conceived what God has prepared to those that love Him. And that we walk with that and we expect that. In fact, I heard something the other day that blew my mind, and I'm glad it did. I was talking to a friend of mine that said another friend of his that God is using in the area of healing in a profound way recently. I don't know the, the, the guy that this happened to, but uh, the person who was telling me this was a reputable person. And he said that, that this, uh, per, this individual, as I recall, I think it was a woman, had an accident. And uh, so it was a bad accident, and she went to the hospital, and they repaired her back, and they put in a whole lot of metal in her back. In fact, it was just not a rod or two. It was actually a, an apparatus. <laughs> and so it, she, you know, walked, and she was able to walk, but she was in pain, and obviously when you have metal where bone should, muscle should be, it's not as comfortable as well. So she went through life and she went to this meeting and this gentleman prayed over her. I don't think it was anything dramatic. He just prayed over her and asked that the Lord would heal her. She went to bed that night and she woke up the next morning and looked over to the side on her bed and there was the apparatus that was in her laying beside the bed. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has ever conceived what God has prepared for those that love Him. She took that apparatus and she went back to the doctor. It still had the, the uh, serial numbers on the, on the metal. And the doctor said, yeah, that's what I put in you. She said, I don't need it anymore. I think she should have got a refund. (laughs) And we go, wow, but we should be going, wow, because we serve an amazing God that anything is possible. And yet, how often do we limit ourselves or perhaps don't stretch ourselves from getting off of natural responses? And then we enter into the carnal area where, yeah, Jesus is Lord, but We don't let him help us with anything. And perhaps 
Miracles are, is the easy part for God. I think the harder part is for him to change our mind. And for us to allow him to help us with our relationships with one another. That we would actually forgive one another and truly forgive, which means to let it go and never bring it up again. I think that's the tougher part that we struggle with in our lives of saying, God, could I walk free of what this person did to me? Could I walk free of what I've done to others that the enemy reminds me of? Could I walk free? And God says, yes. No eye has seen. No ear has heard. No mind has conceived what God has prepared for those that love Him. I'm glad God fooled the rulers and that Jesus went to the cross as he intended to go. But he's not fooling us. He's saying, come to me. Come to me. Not out of a natural response, not out of a carnal response, but out of a spiritual invitation. To grasp hold of whatever you're, wherever you're at, that God would say to you, no eye has seen. Put your name there. No eye has seen, Billy. No eye has seen, Eric. No eye has seen, Denny. No eye has seen, Jim. No ear has heard, Jody. No mind has ever conceived, Steve what God has prepared for those that love Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to You today and, and we thank You, Lord, that we again have the, another opportunity to just um, declare again that You died and rose from the dead so that our sin might be forgiven and that we could receive the seed of righteousness into our life by your Holy Spirit. God, thank you that there's no more just one son. There's an only son that was fathered by you, but we are now adopted sons and daughters into your family. And that's the way you designed it and intended it to be. And so, God, today that we are so grateful that when we say yes to you, that you adopt us fully into your family. And in all the privileges that were granted Jesus are now available to us. Father, I pray that you would show us that if we've been thinking about this thing in a natural way, Lord, I pray that if you, you would show us where we've limited you. We've, we've let you in on some areas and we've walled you out of other areas. Lord, you want access to all of our life, not just partial. And Lord, today may be a day that we invite you fully in. Invite you fully in, Lord. So that you would be glorified in great ways, Lord. So you would come in and live. You say that when we invite you in, you actually come in and live within us. I thought this morning that we would just take the opportunity to reaffirm our faith together as a body. And maybe you're here and you're thinking, you know what, I, I, I think God has been calling me. I'm ready to follow Jesus. I've been putting him off or maybe you're distant. I'm going to give you an opportunity to say with us together and, and, and just maybe for the first time or, or maybe for a time that you, you realize, you know what, I've drifted. God hasn't drifted. He never drifts, but we're the ones that drift. That now I want to come back. 
I want to come back and, and just reaffirm my faith in Jesus this morning. We're going to take an opportunity as a, as a congregation and uh, do that. So would you just pray with me, everyone, together? Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus, your one and only Son, to die on the cross in my place. Thank you for forgiving me. Today I receive Jesus and again state that he is Lord. Come and be Lord over my life. Become my friend. Become my father. Become my helper. I desire to know you, God. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for making me acceptable to God the Father through the death of Jesus. Come in and fill me now. I desire to walk with you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.